Welcome. Uh, you may have noticed I'm not Omar. I'm Ed Willock, and uh, I'm I'm filling in for Omar tonight uh, here on the uh, AV Educate Podcast Edition. Uh, but welcome to our talk with John Huntington. Uh, super excited for tonight's show. Um, you know, show show networking is such a crucial thing on today's productions. Uh, we're all touching something that touches a network uh, these days. If you were doing anything with audio or video, uh, super excited for this. Um, but without any w wasting any more time, I want to bring up uh, Austin Jackson. How you doing, Austin? What's going on, Ed? What's going on, the AV Educate community? Good to be with you guys again here tonight. I'm excited for tonight's episode, but I'm excited for every week. But I think we got some real some goodies tonight. What's going on, Ed? Uh, you know, uh, John. I you know I had the the pleasure of getting to speak to him a little bit, and uh, I think I think our audience is gonna you know really get into this topic of show networking. You know, it's on everybody's mind, even at home. We've all set up home networks now to integrate our vmix machines with our stream decks and uh you know maybe some dante audio what you know all these things uh just even at home because kind of right now homes become our show sites but we're all going to be getting back to it soon enough so uh th i think this is going to be a great talk i think everybody's going to be uh super into it and at this at this point let's start getting some some questions if you have questions about show networking let's see those on the uh coming on in on the comments um so definitely, yeah definitely guys um so tonight's episode as ed already mentioned it's it's we're going to talk about the evolution of the industry we're going to talk about networking and and as ed say we we love to be on show site but at this current moment some of us are working from home some of us are, are working from remote offices and as ed say networking is involved in every aspect of the industry so i, I feel that like tonight's guest has so much value to offer already so if you have any questions about networking if you have any questions about the industry jump into the comments from now but while you do that without further ado let's let's introduce tonight's guest what do you think it's about time I think so. Absolutely. Let's make it happen. So first things first, this guy is a professor. He's he's a professor at City Tech where he does a lot of time, utilizes a lot of his time educating other people in the industry, um, training them on, on entertainment, um, on, on everything all across the boards in the industry. Uh, he has a wealth of knowledge. So without further ado, let's introduce tonight's guest, John Huntington. Hello. Thanks for having me. Welcome, Thank John. you for being here. Yeah, my pleasure. Great. So, John, I, I know there's so much to talk about, and we have a lot of information to, to jam pack within what about 55 minutes. So, I'll let I'll let you take take the reins. Um, cool. One thing we we talked a little about. If I can share my screen, I can show this timeline here. Hang on one second. Click on the right things. There we go. Um, so I, I wrote the, this book, the, which is now called Show Networks and Control Systems, started writing that back in the mid 90s. And back then uh, we were doing a lot more with sort of discrete protocols and hardwired things and contact closures and things like that. And this is like 450 pages of stuff after like five editions. And there's a lot on networking here over the years. Um, but then this, this uh, summer and this fall, I, I released this new book, let's see, try to make it not so glary, called Introduction to Show Networking, which is this big, it's a lot cheaper, um, and I have an ebook version as well. Um, and the reason for that is that, and this is linked from my website if people wanna look at it, that I wrote this a couple years ago, I wrote a couple articles about this. The basic idea of, of that I was sort of doing this on my sabbatical research a couple years ago is that you know, the, the industry progressed, and I'm mostly talking about live shows here, but this applies to installs and things like that as well. Um, where these days there was kind of a slow progression, but there was new technology and things like that. And then I put a date here in 1985 because uh, that's when I graduated from college, but also that's when the sort of things were really kind of going crazy in the industry. I'll go through this a little bit in a minute. Um, and then I feel like we had this crazy period of just crazy, crazy development from the mid eighties, you know, the date can move around, doesn't really matter, but somewhere in there, there was this sort of inflection point. And we went through this insane development 
And then somewhere around like 2010, I feel like things really sort of matured. So this is one of those classic graphs where it's like, you know, it goes slowly, there's a big exponential growth spurt, and then it sort of flattens out. So okay. the, um, oh, I'm trying to scroll the wrong thing here. Um, so these, and you can see all this on my it's linked from my website. These are all sort of seminal shows. And around in here, there was just all this stuff happening where every, you know, U2 tour, every, you know, Broadway show or whatever had some new technology that we really hadn't seen before. And then around like 2010, you know, things, again, it's not that it slowed down, it's just that these tools matured. And I, my general argument about this is like from around about in here somewhere going forward, that now we're working more in like integration and we have this mature sort of toolbox. So we don't have to invent the tools to use them, which is really kind of good in terms of like, you know, our job is uh, storytelling is not invest, not necessarily tool invention. So if somebody invents a new tool, that's great. But a lot of the big challenges that we've had for decades in the industry have really been kind of sorted out. And so the this goes on and on and on through various technologies and stuff. But the basic idea that I'm putting forward here is that, you know, now for sort of any modern show device, there's sort of three things that you need. Rigging, which we're, we have pretty well sorted. I mean, of course, there's always gonna be something new, but we, you know, we have certifications in rigging. We like have standard procedures. We can do it very safely. So you need to get the thing there somehow. Um, you need electricity, of course, for most things. That's also, we have certifications for that. I was actually one of the people on the, still on the group that writes the ESTA certification test for electricians. Um, so there's some networking questions in there. Um, and then uh, control and networking. So those three things now, any new device, projectors, you know, self-powered speaker, moving light, haze machine, laser projector, whatever it is, needs rigging power and data, right? Those are the three things. So the idea now is that most of these things have kind of converged on the standard data platform of Ethernet. So like in the first edition of my book, the mid nineties, I had like three or four pages on ethernet. And now basically the whole book is about it. Is about it. So that's sort well, of that, the progression that's going on, I think. That's definitely how the industry has been pivoting and transitioning. So I feel it, you, you've done an excellent job of making the book thinner. If anything, I would have thought it would have gotten thicker. <laughs> well, it did for a long time. You could sort of plot it until around about you know the the fifth edition of the original book actually got smaller than the fourth edition because as you know there everything now is an ethernet right i mean you're yeah. still going to have dmx you're still going to have other things can you know different types of industrial control scenic automation whatever it is but now we have this sort of standardized highway system so the new book is really about the standardized highway system and i don't cover the protocols and stuff because now first off a lot of those things have been packaged by our, you know, uh, product designers, whether it's a lighting console, uh, you know, video server, sound console with Dante or whatever it is, like these things are sort of built into our systems. So we don't have to get into the low level details quite as much unless you want to do some programming or whatever. But then the sort of transport and like, how do you build a, a you know, a network with good practices? Like that's sort of what the focus is on now. Okay, Under understandable. I, that was actually my next question I was going to ask you. Um, just for the audience and, and everyone who's tuned in and paying attention, uh, give us a, a little bit of back details about this book. Who would want to get involved with this book? What can, information can we find in this book? What type of value and whatnot there is? Well, cool. Since I still got the screen share here, I'll just show this is from my website, which can uh, controlgeek.net. Um, so up here I have, there's a link to the table of contents here. People can look at that. Um, but the basic idea is that I really wrote it for, you know, for, for entry level users, people that are, you know, not a product designer, not like a somebody, you know, most of my friends that do this all the time, like this book is not for them. It's really for the people starting out and it's written, you know, I wrote it thinking about technicians really, you know, first up. So we start with cable and sort of work up where if you go to like, you know, uh, Cisco certification or something, you're going to spend a lot of time like on the OSI layers and things like that. Like I cover that in here, but I don't start with it. Like we get to that part way through. And then what's totally new in this edition, so some of that was adapted from the original, uh, the big book, 
But what's totally new in here is I now have a whole chapter on uh, network system design. So it's, again, it's just sort of my process because there's not really standards on that. And it's not going to tell you, like, again, people always know, and they'll, oh, I want 12 VLANs and a router and blah, 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 blah. Like that, I don't get to that in here. I go through just an overall process of evaluating what you need to do, how you're going to deal with your IP addresses, what's your topology, what's some basic, you know, considerations about it. And then if you want to dig into it, the, the real problem with trying to teach the more advanced stuff is that it's very specific. So Cisco does it one way. HP does it another way, you know, Pathway does it a different way, Luminex does it another way. So that gets into the specifics of the gear, but understanding what a, what a VLAN is and what a router is and things like that, like I cover that here. But most people, I mean, the big problems I see for most people starting out is just the confusion over IP addresses and subnets, right? So yes. I spent a bunch of time on that. And I can, that's like when my classes I teach, like I give them a device and they have to come up with an IP address that will communicate with it. For anybody who's been doing it a long time, that's like seconds, right? You know how to do it. Yeah. But I, we can all remember when, when, when I started out, like what, subnet? Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, so, and in here I have like a real sort of simplified version rather than getting into, the, in the big book I talk about like bit by bit, like how the subnet mass was determined. And then the newer one, I'm like, you know, for most things we're doing, uh, you know, a lot of that subnetting stuff is really important if you're doing like corporate IT uh, with thousands of machines or whatever. But for the, the type of things that we're doing on shows today, uh, you know, usually, you know, like, and we do a big haunted house at my school every year. We weren't able to do it this year. And we usually get like 6,000 people a year come through this thing. And the entire thing is on a big managed network. And even that, like everything is on the network and there's maybe like 40 devices. So, um in that case, we don't have to be like with subnet math, which is the thing that gets really confusing for people. I have a thing in, in here. I don't want this to sound like a commercial the whole time either. <laughs> Happy to answer some questions, but the um, in here I talk about like of a simplified approach with subnets that you don't have to like you know go and look at the subnet mass calculator online, make your head hurt. There's sort of a more simple way that you can go through it. And I would go through. We just don't have enough time to like go through it, but I I, I have it all. It's all in the book to say it that way. Lovely, lovely. Well, yeah, and I guess, you know, so much of today, like the networks that we're using on show sites, uh, you know, maybe the techs don't need to know everything there is to know about subnetting, but they need to know how to make their endpoints work together and and coexist on a network and how you get piece of gear A to talk to software B on, you know, computer C, so... Yeah, and that's the the number one because I mean most people are pretty. And what's happened too, one of the advantages of being old and doing this for a long time is like when we I saw my first you know Ethernet switch for a show in the mid '90s, and back then there was all this issue with like broadcast domain and network diameter and the five four I can't remember this like rule about uh, collision dump collision diameter. I've forgotten all this because we don't care anymore. Um, and now pretty much for like an Ethernet network, there's really only a couple rules to build the topology. So, uh, you know, hundred meters segment length for copper, uh, no loops. That's, and those, that's really like most of it. If you don't, if you do those two things, and I'm trying to think of I'm forgetting something, it's in the book to be definitive. Um, the, the, the network's pretty much just going to work. Um, then when you get more advanced, if you're really going in and pumping like super high res video or something where you're getting into insane bandwidth, now you're into another world. But for anything that's like lighting control, streaming audio, um, connecting to a motion control system, anything like that, the type of bandwidth you're talking about is pretty manageable on just sort of standard networks of today. And there's, you know, like those things, if you follow the few rules about like building the system, you can get it, you can get things communicating. Then the thing that's really abstract, and I know most people, you know, like in the live side, like me, like, I, you know, I suck at math. Uh, like those things, numbers are really hard for me. So making this big abstract thing with all these numbers is very difficult. Um, but the, that unfortunately is sort of like something we just have to deal with. Um, but that's the part I think that most people get confused on, like just the idea of a subnet. Like, but when you really get it, like if you just say, oh, well, there's these numbers, they have to match in these ways in order to be able to communicate. It's like an address, you know, the, uh, uh, if you get those things right, then the rest of it, uh, you know, that, that's sort of the hard part. The rest of it will, will sort of work itself out or it'll be handled by our manufacturers who do a lot of that stuff. 
Okay. Well, we got some comments already coming in um, and some questions. Uh, Omar was asking, what kind of equipment are you networking together on a show site? Um, so the, at my school, the city tech where we, and again, we haven't been in there uh, this year, but, or now we're going in this year, but um, we've used a lot of like Cisco small business stuff. But I say really these days for most people, again, and my, you know, my background is in live shows more than install, but the, you know, I've done some install over the years, but for, I really recommend these days to get switches that, and equipment that are made for our industry. So there's a few manufacturers and I, and, I probably forget a couple if I list them, but uh, Pathway uh, Connectivity and then um, Luminex and there, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank on some of the other ones, but those are the ones I really kind of recommend today because those things are optimized and dialed in for our world. So, and I always tell a funny story about um, on the haunted house that so we have like, like I said, 40 or 50 things around the network and we have four switches all spread around the building. And uh, so I went in, uh, was it whatever 2019, wherever we did it last to configure this, like for Dante for audio, there's a couple things you're supposed to configure about energy efficient ethernet and that kind of stuff. And I went into that page on the switch and was like typing in there. And then I clicked okay on the, the configuration for the switch and like every light and every switch went out. I'm like, what, you know, <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I killed the entire network. And I'm like, what is going on? You know, and I'm like thinking, I'm like, do it, you know, fortunately I, I do this like long before showtime. Um, and of course what it turned out was deep in the Cisco configuration next to the energy efficient ethernet thing is a checkbox that turns all the lights off and all the switches. So, and it's like, okay, I can see where you might want that feature, but uh, it really screwed me up for a minute. I mean, it only was like panicking for about five minutes before I figured it out. But so, five minutes is a long time when you're panicking, though. The yeah, anxiety yeah. levels is up. The little sweat is already yeah. trickling. <laughs> but then the nice thing about that, so again, that's you know, those switches are a little bit cheaper. But if I had gotten one that was made for for show networking purposes, I wouldn't have that problem because that feature would be buried and away from you. Also, things like configuring VLANs and stuff like that is much, much easier on these switches that are made for show purposes. Okay. Uh, do it and, you know, you can get an off the shelf, you know, Cisco, HP, whatever your favorite uh, switch is uh, or hardware. Uh, you can do it, but, it, you know, some of the ones these days that are made for shows just literally have a knob on the front panel and you're like, okay, I want jack number four to be on VLAN five and you're done. Otherwise, you're going to like the tagging screen and the web page and the configuration or typing line or something. So again, that's I really recommend uh, that you know get use the switches made for for our business. And then beyond that, it's really the it depends on what you're doing and the um, you know go with the we have a lot of help from the manufacturers, whatever side you're in, um, you know whether it's lighting, video, sound, whatever you're doing. The, the manufacturers of our gear will tell you what's the right the right equipment to get. And then if you're really getting more advanced and building sort of integrated networks and stuff, then that, that does take a bit more sort of in-depth training and so on. Random question, what makes the huge difference between a switch that's created specifically for our industry as opposed to us using just an off-the-shelf switch? Oh, good question. And also, I should also d differentiate between um, like consumer grade stuff we just shouldn't be using right it, pretty much on any show install whatever if you're getting it at best buy you know off the shelf you're not getting the right stuff right Copy. you also don't want like a lot of these companies and i talk about cisco a lot just because they're sort of like the very widely used system but they make this like crazy enterprise level stuff that you know if you're building an entire building with thousands of computers on it that's what you want um, but there's a, somewhere in between there in, in the sort of commercial IT world, uh, there's like things like for like small business grade. That's the stuff that I use. Um, and the so that so those are the, the type of things. That, but then, for example, I mean, the, the, the other example I always use, like I know the guy that that engineered the pathway switch. Right. So if I really have a problem, I could get him on the phone. There's no way I'm ever getting through to anybody at like HP. You know, in the, that design. Got it. Level. Got it. But then also these things are just set up for our protocols. So it depends on whatever side you're coming from. Um, there's some optimization you want to do for like lighting control. That's just built in. 
right? Got it. You get it. You get it. Dante, there's there's people like over, uh, you know, Dante for audio and some video now. Uh, people really go crazy and like try to over engineer engineer these things. But there's a couple key things you should do. You really don't have to get into some of the prioritization unless you're really good doing crazy stuff. But that's just like a setting in the switch. You're like, oh, this switch, Dante, turn on. Streaming ACN, turn on that setting. Yeah. And then you don't have to worry about it. And if you have a problem, you have you got somebody to help you. Because that's the other thing. If you're doing, you know, we all know what it's like being on a show. Like when you get into that panic mode and you click the wrong box and turn all the lights off on all your switches, um, you know, that way there's somebody you can call. And so, you you know, they cost more, but you're paying for that uh, optimization for our industry. And also you get some you, much easier to get support. too. I was going to say tech support is a huge issue and a huge feature, especially when you're coming in on the back end and you need to do something in, a, in crunch time. When those five minutes are, have you sweating too much. <laughs> yeah. But I love it. Love it. And then just the other thing I'll say, like, that sweat time for me was like at least a week before opening of this of our haunted house. So that's one thing I tell everybody with the, you know, in the old days, I think things were simpler and it was troubleshooting a little bit easier because you just put your hand on the cable, follow it over here. Oh, somebody kicked the plug out. Right. And those are still very common. Like I had, I, it, you know, again, if you use decent cable, you don't have much problem, but I had one problem where like a Dante device was just coming on and offline and offline. And I went, I'm like, what is going on? And then I'm thinking it's like some crazy thing. And I went and looked at the back of the the connectors on the like Yamaha mixer and the lights were just going on and off on the Ethernet connection. Yeah, it was a bad cable. So, and, and then, you know, I should have tested it, whatever, but the, so, I, and usually I still think like connections, whether it's cable, uh, copper, fiber, whatever you're doing or power, like those are always, that's always the, you know, that's the majority of the problems. But it is a little scary because we're sort of, you know, you can't really see it. There's, again, this is why I really recommend buying a switch made for our industry because uh, you can't see inside this stuff. It's very frustrating. I mean, that's sort of our world now, right? But you can't you can't get in there and sort of, you know, mess around with it. Uh, you really, it's just this bunch of abstract like bits flowing around. And it's, you know, so again, you, you want to have some help for that if you get it. But again, most things I think if you just follow some like basic procedures, get the, you know, think it through, design the system in the first place, like with some good practices, then you really, the, other, the, the upside of this stuff is just like very, very reliable. And I don't know so, if people have horror stories about equipment failure. I was interested to hear them. <laughs> to, to that point, uh, what would be some of those, some best practices when you're setting up a show network? Um, I hate to it's say it. <laughs> Yeah, I have on my, um, I'd have to dig it out, but the, I, on my website, if people search, just search best, best practices, um, which I don't want to like do in the live stream at the moment, but I have a, a website about that. Uh, sorry, I have a blog entry about that. It's a little bit out of date. The one in the uh, book, let's see if I can, if this will come up. The search, I use uh, Squarespace and the internal search on here is not great. So I often have to go to Google uh, to do it. I uh, didn't find it, of course. Um, but yeah, the, hold on. Let me give you one second. If you have another question while I'm searching this, I can find it. Point people to that link. Um, yeah, no. So uh, to go even further back to the one you were talking about, the timeline, um, what would be some examples of maybe like those uh, in those three eras, let's call them, uh, like in the early design, what would be a show a show control system that, fit into that time period versus the rapid development and the maturity phases. Sure. And I, uh, I'll just show you, uh, this thing, I'll show you the, I found the page here back from 2016. Um, and there's the, I can paste the URL in the comments or something, but, um, so I have in here, people can find this whole list. This is just public online can go through some of this stuff that people want. Um, but I think to that question, I, I think it's kind of interesting back in here in sort of the early days, um, so I don't know if you know Bob McCarthy, who's at Meyer, and he's like the, you know, one of the developers of Sim and like, you know, the early pioneer in system analysis. So he um, tells a great story about like the Beatles at Shea Stadium, like his wife and his brother, they always say that they saw that show. 
right? They didn't hear it. No one heard it, right? The Beatles couldn't hear each other. There's no stage monitors. And you've seen the video, you know, on the film, you know, it sounds great because they had a direct feed into the recording, but no one in the crowd heard anything. So Bob made a great point, and I quote him in the, one of the articles I wrote about this, is that, you know, effectively, when they, you know, the producers of that show produced this show where we did not have, you know, the technology to do what they were trying to do, right? It, it just, it, you know, it was, it's a historic event because um, of who it was, but as a show, it was kind of a failure. Like nobody heard it. You know, the people screaming, they don't care. You know, they were there and they were, there. <laughs> but uh, the show experience was terrible. Like there was just the field lighting. Nobody could hear anything. They came out and uh, I think you know, there's interviews with Ringo about like, He's just watching. He's looking at their, people's butts in front of him, right? And <laughs> for the beat, and he has no. No one can hear anything. And now a show like that, you know, there's people all over the country. You know, we could do a thousand of these in one day. You know, there's it's very common. So I think what's come from that time, and also like Woodstock, and that's really interesting too because I think that thing. And I'm also as a I'm a storm chaser and kind of a weather geek. That the um, and I wrote on my blog uh, all these articles about these horrible stage stage roof collapses that were happening five, six, seven years ago. Um, you know, Woodstock was like one thunderstorm away from being a disaster, like total disaster. So I think it's this whole thing has gone over the years. And like Wall of Sound, too, from the Grateful Dead, like everybody's like, oh, Wall of Sound. You know, the people I know that heard it, that it really <laughs> didn't work very well, right? And you have the entire PA behind the band. They did some really fancy things to cancel out the feedback and so on. But you know, but I give them a huge credit for doing it. These were incredible experiments mm -hmm. on how to do this stuff. But now, and then, you know, the advantage in the, like when I got into business in the mid eighties, I remember at our shop, cause I worked for the special effects company called Associates and Farron. And I remember at our shop, they brought us the first Jumbotron, um, you know, which was CRT, individual CRT pixels. And the pixels were like one inch square, you know, and I was just at a photography museum here in New York where they had a display. And I literally, you know, in, in daylight, I'm like, man, that's a pretty good projector. And I went up and realized it was actually a video wall, but the pixels were so small that it looked good. So this is sort of the, you know, people my age and, and even older have sort of lived through that transition. Um, but then I think in the 80s, I think it gets more down, depending on which area, area you are in. Um, you know, DMX obviously was a huge thing. That's now... 30 years old or something mm -hmm. and being a sound guy I can beat up on lighting people a bit and say look you guys should really move on to, from this thing um, <laughs> and then like rigging we went from uh, like and people that have done rigging or do rig now are aware of rigging you know when they originally the chain motors that we use for every kind of show now were not designed to to fly with the with the hook down that's sort of the standard way that we use for shows because you don't want to hoist the whole hoist up to the roof you want to pull the chain up but they were designed to go the other way so these guys are figuring this out in the 70s early 80s like hey we can flip this thing and now of course like the engineering's been done that's all sort of sorted out and it sound of course the big transition is digital you know which i uh, you know i'd certainly lived through all that but that's pretty you know different console interfaces are, are different now but the uh you know digital consoles are sort of the thing now and then video, I think, is the last one that we're sort of living through the end of that transition now, where obviously we're we're looking at it right now with digital video, uh, sort of local distribution over a network is the thing that's sort of getting sorted out. Uh, from my vantage point, there's sort of three things happening now. Um, that I know, oh man, I just blanked on the acronym, but what's the? But anyway, one is SDVOE. That's seeing a lot more sort of distribution in. Um, uh, sort of install world, the and I'm so bad at numbers. Like it's simply what's the the number twenty one ten twenty one ten the new the newer standard yeah. that's coming out. Yeah, yeah, that's sort of you know taking up a lot of applications in in uh, broadcast stuff, and then the new tech one that I cannot remember the, the NDI actual, NDI yeah, yes. that's seeing a lot of cool stuff happening. So to me, it's sort of like those three things in video distribution are, are sort of like, and people know more than me, but that's what I'm sort of seeing as like what's happening in that world. And I, the other thing I think that I've, I've thought about looking at standards for a long time is that, uh, you know, there's not gonna be one standard for this stuff. Like, and in the audio world, Dante is very dominant on the mixer and microphone side, but of course this Milan effort, which is based around ABB, 
that's really, you know, the speaker manufacturers are really driving that. So I don't think, I think, you know, some of the ABV people are saying, like, oh, well, Dante is a transitional technology, whatever. I think they're just both going to exist, you know, because they're here now. Then the argument I make in my school, you know, we bought a Yamaha CL5 what, five, six years ago. We're not getting a new console anytime soon. We're using Dante for the next 10 years, right? I don't care. If, even if they invented something amazing that uh, made everything better, I won't be able to afford the console until this one really, you know, wears out. So these choices are often made for us by the manufacturers, our industry. Um, but I think that, but the one thing all these things have in common is that, you know, a piece of cat five is a piece of cat five, piece of fiber is a piece of fiber, IP address is an IP address, however it's assigned by the various things. And then again, we back to the book, that's sort of why I sort of feel like we kind of coalesced around that. So I don't know if I really answered your question, but the uh, I can ramble about this stuff all day. <laughs> No, no that's I mean, you're, you're doing an excellent job of actually diving in, into that information. And one of the great points that I feel that you just brought up is even if the console has some date to it or whatever, the fact that we have these capabilities and we see the evolution of the industry shows us that gear should not go as obsolete as quickly as it used to, because with this evolution and this transition, we'll be able to adapt new features as we're moving forward. Oh, don't tell the managers, though. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> well, <laughs> and you can even, Austin, to that, to that point, Austin, too, you can look at some old consoles, you know, like now, you know, you, John, you mentioned you have a CL5, but how many um, M7 CLs do you still see out in the wild that they took a couple uh, MY16 Dante cards, slapped them in, and now these things that definitely should have been retired are <laughs> now being able to integrate with the newer technology uh, so it's, you know, digital networking as Dante right now is the, is the, the hot flavor, you know, and I, I use Dante every day, but I, I know that around the corner, there'll be something else, you know, nobody talks about CobraNet anymore or like these other protocols. And, and those are also the difference. I guess it's not, those are proprietary, uh, you know, pr protocols as opposed to standards. We mentioned 2110 and how much. Uh, do the do the protocols, the proprietary ones, push the development forward as opposed to the standards? Because the standards sometimes, I guess, try to catch up. Yeah, that's a really great question, and I could talk about that for about an hour and like bore the <laughs> hell out of everybody. But um, I'm involved with in ESTO, which is Entertainment Services Technology Association. They have a control protocol working group that I've been. I'm not. I don't like do much on it, but I've been in that group for a long time. Uh, voting representing the state and union here in New York. And the, um, yeah, so the standards, it, it's fascinating. There's a bunch of things happening at once, but um, I've seen several efforts in the last 25 years or so that I've been sort of following this, where some really brilliant people come up with an amazing standard, put it out in the industry, an uh, open standard, put it in the industry, and it dies, right? Uh, in the lighting market, there's a, uh, a uh, thing called ACN, Ar was Architecture for Control Networks. Um, amazing protocol, went into the market, nobody implemented it. So now people stick with DMX. DMX is around 1986 or something, right? Old serial protocol, very crude architecture on it, but it worked. And there's millions and millions of products around the world that haven't implemented. So now what they're doing, so I, I think that the standards effort was probably a little bit too ambitious and trying to define too much, even though like from a pure design and technology standpoint, it was amazing. It was a fantastic protocol. It worked, it's implemented, um, but the, it was ahead of the market. So I think the real successful standards are the ones that are sort of pulled by the market into existence. So like Dante, Dante is actually built on some open standards. So like their precision time protocol and things like that, which are just standards. Obviously they have some secret sauce in there that they're not gonna, you know, they're not gonna disclose. Um, you could reverse engineer it if you really wanted to, but they're also selling a solution to manufacturers like, hey, you don't have to worry about this stuff. Just buy this card, stick it in your gear, and it'll go from there. So I think, you know, and I have this in the, the original book. I have a whole, you know, I have a few pages about this. Like when I was young and got into the business, I was like, oh, this is stupid. Like, why do we have 25 different things? Why don't we just have one? Like, this would be so much easier for everybody. And then I, my thinking evolved over the decades, I hate to say. Um, 
gone from like, hey, not only is that not really practical, but I also don't think it's the best way to do it. So, you know, because I think what happens is if you try to make one standard for everything. So in like in the show control world, there's a thing called MIDI show control based on MIDI. Um, that was designed to run everything in a theme park. And there was like one theme park attraction. It was the Water World Traction Universal. I think it was the only part attraction ever built because there was one guy, Universal, in charge. Is like you have to build gear to this, and then it never went anywhere after that because, you know, it worked great for some things, and it's still being used like in lighting control and simple interconnection and stuff. Um, but it, you know, trying to make one standard for everything just is almost sort of doomed to failure. Um, so there's always, so I think now what you see, but I do think so. Something like Ethernet is a good example where it defines something very simple. Like all it does is it moves bits. It doesn't care what the, where the bits are, where they're going, whatever it is. Um, and, and how much, whether it's digital video, whether it's control, whatever it is, Ethernet can carry all of that. But it, it that's all it defines. So in fact, like in the, the, uh, the I keep calling it the big book, but the original book, because it, it is big. Um, <laughs> the, uh, and I'm, it's the, anyway, but the, that one had a lot of protocols in it because sort of back in the day, really to make it an operating system and really understand it, you at least had to have some knowledge of what the protocol was, like how it functioned and so on. Now I think that's been packaged for us for the most part. So like I always talk about, we talk about TCP and UDP. You know, I have a, a book on my in my office at school on TCP. It's like 400 pages. I've never read it, right? <laughs> I looked at it, you know, I probably read a little bit of it, but it works, right? I use, T we're using, probably we use TCP or UDP right now. It's just built, built in and it works. So we don't need to, you know, there's some implications. I talk about this in the book. There's some implications about the difference between like from the end user perspective on the, uh, between TCP and UDP. Um, but do we really need to know like the gory details of that. Not really. And I took, back oh man in the 2000s early 2000s sometime i took like a, a a real low level protocol course on one of these transport protocols and man if you have any sleep problems like that <laughs> <laughs> and i admire the people that can i'm glad we have brilliant engineers that can do that stuff for us but i didn't i got in this business because i like to do shows and i like to make cool stuff not you know that level engineering like is just not for me <laughs> yeah, so, but that's, it's important, but it's sort of built into our chips and our software now. I, I feel the same way uh, with the the Yamaha Sound Reinforcement Handbook. I, you know, so much great information, but if you're having some insomnia, you can pick up that book and, <laughs> and it'll it'll help cure oh, that. Great. <laughs> yeah, but yeah. it's still still a great resource. You know, oh, yeah. 30, 40 years later. Um, not much about digital in there, though, unfortunately. No, no, no. Written pre-digital. <laughs> yeah. Uh, in book. the comments, uh, Iris Solomon Huff says, uh, wireless DMX is great when it works. That's, <laughs> and yeah. that's, that's more the, the wireless part than the yeah. DMX part. Than the DMX portion, yeah. <laughs> yeah, my advice for anything is if you can use a cable, use a cable, right? Whether it's copper, fiber, whatever. Uh, only if it's the you know performer running all over the stage, if it's going on a piece of scenery that's like spinning around and moving, like okay, then you got to do it. And uh, old friend of mine is Gary Fails, who's the um, uh, city theatrical president, of city theatrical, amazing guy. And like his vision is like for lighting control is like getting rid of all cables, and they make an amazing product. Like they're, uh, and we actually did some testing for them. Oh man, ten or fifteen years ago now where we were testing like some some of his competitors products i mean we did nothing you know duplicitous we just went and got them um that were based around like standard wi-fi technology and this is a while ago and then and his stuff and we found problems in all of it mostly that in order to go over like sort of standard wi-fi like you have to put an immense amount of delay in there to let everything line back up and if you're trying to do, you know lighting and you know on the beat to the music like that doesn't work and it was a result of that test we did. He, there's a whole article about this somewhere that he went back and they actually engineered their own radios. So now like the, the, for wireless DMX, there's other companies. I just, those are the guys I know, uh, City Theatrical. They actually made their own radios that it still uses the same idea as Wi-Fi and the frequency hopping stuff. But what would happen is standard Wi-Fi would jump frequencies in the middle of a DMX uh, frame. 
right? So they actually made their own radio that would wait until between DMX updates in order to skip frequencies and stuff. Got it. So they they make their stuff is amazing. I think it's you know it's really really robust. We use it when you know when we can't get a cable or something. But to me, if I can run a run a cable, I'm still going to run a cable. Yeah, I've used some uh, some of the. Or I think they were version two of Show Babies that were on Wi-Fi still at that point using 2.4 and the reliability. You know, you always had to put them at the top of the truss and <laughs> you know make sure that they they had great line of sight. Um, and that's mostly because using them in a hotel ballroom in New York City, the uh, the Wi-Fi traffic is extremely yeah. cluttered. So and it, yeah. it is amazing that frequency hopping stuff is kind of built for. Uh, crazy interference environments like that. So it, it, it's, I'm still amazed that like, I just, my whole philosophy is just like sort of, and you know, Wi-Fi, wireless, whatever is a last resort, but I'm still kind of amazed like what you can get away with on Wi-Fi, you know, yeah. living in New York, especially. And now again, the, the, I have some, some graduates in our program that do all these like crazy, uh, you know, Thanksgiving Day Parade and things like that in the middle of Times Square. And now what they're doing is just sort of building these network zones across 42nd Street or whatever, you know, which is such a, and now whatever it is, whether it's comm or your wireless mic or whatever, it's kind of entering into this network zone. Um, and they're just like running fiber all over the place and everything. So it's, again, some of that's not like pure Ethernet and networking and stuff, but it's the, the idea that you can kind of coordinate all this stuff now is pretty amazing. And it's again made, you know, uh, made a new uh, job out of it. So I, that's another thing I've done a little bit of research on. But I always feel like new technologies very rarely make for less jobs. They mostly just make for new jobs. So there's not as many jobs these days. Like, and I had a, I had like lunch with an old time Broadway general manager years ago about this, and he had worked like on the original My Fair Lady and whatever year forty something, and I was talking to him in two thousand something. And I was like, what's the crew size back then and now? He's like, the same. So back then they had 50 guys pushing boxes and tying knots and pulling ropes. And now they have moving light technician, A1, A2, video screen, you know, so all these things. So we tend to like up the ante and up the ante. So you see these, and I've done some work for the Radio City Christmas show and stuff. And there's what well, didn't run this year, unfortunately, but there's, uh, you know, there's still, I don't know what the crew is in there, 200 or something. It's, it's just huge. So it does, and these things very rarely, like, just put people out of work that way. That's a whole other topic. And, no, no, I, and I'm actually glad that you touched base on that because I feel that's a, a huge fear of a lot of the technicians in the industry. As technology increases and, and gets better, we believe that it's going to eliminate the, the manpower, the labor that, that's needed and things of the sort. And I really haven't seen an elimination in terms of position, but as you said, just a, a transfer, a transformation in what those positions call for. Yeah. yeah. And somebody like me, like I said, I graduated in 1985. Like Ethernet existed then, but nobody was using it in our business. So, um, and I have one of the articles I have linked from my website on that is that sort of like the amount of skills, the specialization of skills that you need now compared to 25 years ago is much higher than it was. Because like, and I always say like everything, in fact, either one of these books was not taught to me by anybody in any school because it just wasn't existing at those times. But now, again, things are, so we did have this like exponential growth in the, and sort of the technical knowledge needed. But I really feel like that's, it's higher, but it's stabilized now. So again, like if you learn what an IP address is, you make that investment into learning some basic networking skills and stuff. Um, that's not, I, I don't believe that's going obsolete anytime soon. Maybe we go to IP version six or something, which I'm a little dubious about. Um, but even then it's still the same thing. I think we're using the rest of my career, you know, uh, and I'm in my fifties, so I don't have to predict too far out, but the, um, I think, you know, ethernet IP addresses, and they, like all these sort of basic technology that's talking about before, I think we're, I, I don't see them going away anytime soon. I think that if you look at a, a backstage of the show today, backstage of the show 10 years ago, it looks pretty familiar. And I think that's probably true 10 years from now. I mean, who knows, like uh, 2020 derailed a lot of things, but, um, <laughs> but where I'm seeing like interesting stuff happening is again, in the integration between these, which, you know, was always possible. I mean, obviously, you look at what, and I talk about some of this in, in the older book, 
know, I have a little bit of a history of show control and stuff in there. Like, you know, like Disney was doing amazing things in the 70s, 80s and onward. Um, now we're seeing a lot of those things that can be done because Ethernet exists. Like the Ethernet doesn't really make it possible, but it makes it affordable and cheap. So the old way, like integrate things like, oh, it'd be all this. Now it's like, hey, we can plug this cable between us. We have to figure out if you're talking between lighting and video or sound and pyre or whatever. To like figure out what we're going to send to each other, but I know I can get my message into your system. It makes where, the communication a lot easier. Yeah, because in the 90s, you know, when the like doing show control where you're trying to link different systems together, you would have to pick your approaches by what was available in the gear. Like, mm -hmm. oh, this console, lighting, sound, video, whatever, only has this kind of connector on the back, so I can't get anything other than that into it. Anything built in the last 10 years um, you know, more or less, this is going to have an Ethernet jack on it. They yeah. understand your protocol or whatever, but that's something that's solvable with some kind of, you know, interfacing yeah. software or whatever. But these sort of like basic, as I always say, sort of the basic highway system is built. So that means now if you want to have your video track your automated scenery, there's actually, I haven't read it yet, but in the control yeah. protocol working group just uh, had a standard about this recently. Like that's now, there's a standard for that. There's a bunch of companies doing it. It, 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 you know, that you go see something like Ka at Surface Soleil, which you know, I'm terrible with dates, but let's say 10 years ago, like that was an incredible engineering feat to do that back then. It'd still be an incredible engineering feat today. And I hope it re I think it'll reopen. Uh, I think well, most of those surf shows will come back. Um, but if you're going to do that today, you could buy this, you know, disguised server and this automated scenery thing. You network them together. You know, I'm, I'm sort of simplifying it, but you network those things together and you could do this pretty readily. It doesn't make it easy, but that means like I also have another graduate from our program that like all he does is like D3 disguised integration and programming. Like that's now another job that didn't exist, you know, 10 years ago. But again, it's all network is enable all. I think you're, you're, you're muted, Ed. <laughs> Sorry about that. I had a little background noise there. Uh, Chris Russo had uh, commented a little while back, AVB is back, baby. So <laughs> he, Chris yeah, is a fan of the AVB. It's still, it never really went away. And I, I, I've i literally written about 50,000 words about this on my blog. I usually do it updated every year after Infocom, which we didn't have this year. But um yeah, AVB has like three different names. It was AVB, originally Audio Video Bridging. Then it was TSN, which was Time Sensitive Networking. Because the original AVB, like really, it didn't really take off in the live market, which were some of the people that are pushing it. Um, but like automotive loves it. So especially you think about a Tesla, like the number of cameras and, and interfacing and things like that, like the weight of the copper to run analog, you know, camera cables out, things like that. Can be significantly reduced if you network it so but they need synchronization so that's what abb offered and then it became tsn and then in recent years it became milan which uh it's some of the big speaker companies uh meyer uh dmb i'm gonna forget somebody i've already forgotten the other company um anyway um, the, acoustics. acoustics and a couple others like they now in the last few years um have come up with this thing called milan but the big problem for that, so it exists. It's there now. If you if you buy uh, the thing that comes to mind is like the um, uh, Meyer did the Metallica tour. That was something my friend Bob Car McCarthy was out there. Um, and if you're asked Bob his opinion about Metallica someday, not the personality, but just the music, he's very he has some strong opinions about it. <laughs> it makes it sound amazing. Um, so that kind of stuff is all done on ABB. But right now, if you if you buy a console from Yamaha or whoever, some console companies are still using um, uh, Maddie and some other solutions. But right now, like there's, you know, I don't, I don't. And people can correct me if I'm wrong, but I don't know of many. I can say there's a couple, but I don't know of many big consoles that have like a Milan jack on them. So that still means you're probably coming in. If you're buying Yamaha, you're buying, you're getting Dante, right? So that you're going to, you're still going to have to come out from Dante and go out ABB somehow or Moan. And there are solutions to do that. There's things that you can just buy a rack mount unit that has two jacks on it and it's ABB on one and Dante on the other. And we can get the audio across, which is the important part. Just means like the device discovery and stuff like that will be, you know, limited to the boundary of that system. So, yeah. 
I actually do work at a theater at a uh, at a college campus up uh, a SUNY campus in Westchester up at SUNY Purchase. And in one of the theaters that recently got renovated, um, it's a CL console, Yamaha, that does Dante. And for the use with our cinema system there, it's a QSIS core. Uh -huh. So there's we can take in Dante, uh, but then to get to the acoustics rig, we have to convert to, uh, I think we're doing AES that yeah. we send um, so, uh, with a red net device to end up converting so there's just like a handful of conversions and that latency adds up. You know, those are things that you have to consider when you're, when you're doing all these conversions. Um, and like you mentioned, you know, some Digico consoles are still using Matty and uh, we do have a Matty bridge, a Dante to Matty bridge, you know, that we could send to our, uh, our music department uh, for the college where the recording arts kids could be, pulling in 64 channels of audio. So all these things allow you to do it, but there's conversions and there's trade-offs. Um, yeah, and and I now think that, I don't think any one of these solutions will ever take over, right? I think we're, our world will forever be like this. And especially like if you, uh, I do a, um, I do like AB for a live weekly circus show and the um, a Bindle Stiff Family Circuit, if you want to watch it, it's really done on a shoestring, great people, it's worth supporting, so watch that on Monday night. But like, I just got, this week, I got a video file from a different source, it wouldn't play back in QAB, right? And it's some encoding nightmare of whatever, and I think, you know, these things, this is, I think, when I was in my 20s, they're like, oh, this is stupid, why don't we just have one video format? It's not going to happen, there's always going to be 15, this stuff's going to go on, so exactly <laughs> This manufacturer is the big Dante. Some manufacturers don't like Dante because it's proprietary. They, there's, you know, theories that it's owned by Yamaha or whatever. It's a publicly traded company. But the, you know, <laughs> that that connection is conversion. I think that's just that's our, like, you know, that's our life now. You know, they're just going to be. You're never going to have one solution clean unless you're in one manufacturing company. And now, so it's interesting because we talked a little bit uh, earlier uh, back in the 80s. You said you saw a lot of different protocols. And then recently, in recent years, Dante's kind of been become a, a dominant thing. But now what I'm seeing, um, and tell, you know, tell me if that you're seeing the same sort of thing, with uh, you know, newer consoles like the Ravage series and then the Digicos, they're coming out with their own proprietary fiber networks like Twin Lane and OptiCore and things like that. So is that almost like a move back to where oh everyone's going to have their kind of their own protocol, their own not a substantial fiber protocol, and something that's again now not a networkable uh, in the sense of IP or you know or uh, infrastructures. So what do you think about that? Yeah, that's a good, I'd have to go look that up because I uh, I've been operating at the lower tier of Yamaha products and not been able to work with that revised stuff. Um, but I'm sure. I mean, again, I, I would wager that they have a Dante connection for that being Yamaha. Um, yeah, they I, still interface with Dante, but like if you want to use their newer boxes that are doing oh, okay. 96k and all that stuff yeah. that they want to support that because it should take any sample rate. Um, but I don't know, I'd have to research it. But again, I think the anything within it, like again, we we're just talking about like Meyer L Acoustics and and uh, I can't get all these companies, DMB, the um, you know, like all there's there's you know, any, even within that within that world, there is no like unified patch solution. So I always talk to my friends that like work on ABB. I'm like, this is fantastic, like you know, but the vast majority of end users, Dante to them is the patch screen. Right, it's not about oh, this is better. It's four microseconds faster, or whatever it is. Doesn't matter because what they are like, hey, I can get these things. I can get you know, patch these wired mics into my console just by plugging it in, um, and that's through you know, Dante is proprietary in that way. But I think these sort of boundaries, I think, are just going to continue on, and it's just our job to like figure out how to get across that. But I do think it's sort of hilarious when we have like one network ecosystem here on this side and another one on that side. And we're running like, you know, AES three, two channel stereo on an XLR between the two systems, which is a lot of how a lot of those things get, get interfaced. I mean, that's a little too far. Uh, I think we're losing some connections at that point, but in the big picture too, like you want to plug your stage box into your console, but the speaker controller really can kind of exist in its own world. So maybe it doesn't matter. Got it. Yeah. Got it. 
what I see well, a lot too now, I guess, is um, you know, tra uh, network management is is crucial. So uh, in this new kind of virtual space where we're all at home, there's a lot of people who are utilizing things like NDI and might also be utilizing Dante. And you know, both of those things want their QoS to kind of be the top priority. So uh, how do you um, how do you manage those sorts of things? Yeah, that can, that's a good question. Once you get on the internet, like you're in a different realm and that's really an area I try to avoid. <laughs> so the, um, and then we just don't have a lot of control over it. Um, inside, you know, mostly on a, like on a show, a lot of those things can be managed by um, uh, just the way you partition your network, right? Because if you don't have a lot of other traffic on there, the QoS, you know, they really don't even recommend um, necessarily turning it on unless you really have a problem like if you i'm a dante trainer and if you read their training materials like level one and two is like if you get it if you're just plugging like four things together just get on a managed switch and don't worry about it you know when that really comes into play is when you're like hey we're doing a show in this big corporate facility and i want to get a vlan from this venue to that one and i have to do it then you got to start thinking about the qos stuff and a lot of that, though, has been written, you know, more for the IT department than for us, because a lot of the work that has to be done is really on their end. But they, you know, like Audinate, I know, has done a lot of work on that to be able there's like documents you can just give to the IT guy and say, this is the parameters you need. And then they're very happy to, like, you know, do that in their world. If you're building like a pure show system, I, a lot of these, like, you know, just good enough bandwidth. Again, once you get into video, like high res video, everything gets crazy. But um, especially for audio, like just good enough bandwidth is fine. And you can, if you just plug things in and get a decent switch, um, you probably won't. You won't even have to mess with that too much. Even like NDI and stuff when you're not up at running like crazy 10 gig, you know, uncompressed 4K. Like I, I keep talking about my graduates, but I have another graduate at um, Radio City for the Christmas show where they have. I don't know the numbers. Let's say they have 20 projectors projecting on the dome, and that's something like 20 or 30 4K completely uncompressed stream. So then you're in a different realm, and you're working with like specialists and stuff like that. Uh, like I don't know what he's doing over there, but yeah, I'm I'm currently specking out 10 gig NICs for my VMix builds, and it's like, how did we get here? How, yeah, you know, <laughs> to handle it, the NDI traffic. Um, so I I actually had the pleasure of working with. Um, someone who uh, went, uh, was one of your students. Oh. And uh, today he messaged me and was like, oh man, I can't believe you have John Huntington coming on. And I asked him, oh, what's some interesting stuff you remember? And you you mentioned it, but the storm chasing, can you tell us a little bit about <laughs> about that? Um, well, you can see some pictures on the wall back here, but <laughs> yeah, I've just always been fascinated by weather. And then um, the, and I have that counter because I sold some pictures to that counter, some lightning stuff. But yeah, I just love, I've loved storms. And then since about, for about the last, I think in the 80s when I was living out on Long Island, we had a big hurricane hit. And I just like drove down to the ocean to watch it come in. And it took like 10 minutes to drive down and like two and a half hours to drive home around all the down trees and stuff. I was like, Jeez. oh, I have to think about the, um, but then once we got, uh, and the old timer storm changes, like, oh, you kids today have it so easy. But once we got affordable, um, you know, mobile internet, uh, that it made it a lot easier. And then I, but I did actually take like college level meteorology classes stuff. And then I, for about the last 10 years or so, I sneak out whenever I can. Of course, peak season, everything's crazy now, but the peak season traditionally has been in May. So I usually sneak out uh, as like the day classes end and drive west um, and go last year. I went chasing this year anyway, because it's, uh, sort of inherently socially distanced. You're like in a car by yourself or in a field somewhere and you just have to worry about the hotel. So I drove about like 5,000 miles this year out and it wasn't a great season for chase. Great for people in Oklahoma that didn't get hit by tornadoes. But um, uh, yeah, so I, it's amazing. It's sort of awe-inspiring. It's very difficult um, and it's, it's a lot of failure, right? You go out and uh, I think it's like, I think it's the same thrill that uh, my performer friends feel like when they're in front of an audience, so they sacrifice a lot and travel thousands of miles to get that hour in front of the audience. To me, that's the same thing if you're standing in front of one of these storms that's like as big as Mount Everest. And, um, you know, except the audience doesn't kill you. <laughs> that's right. <yeah. laughs> 
And then they just had I had bad tornado. Like this is the season for Alabama. They just had nighttime tornadoes. Like I think it was last night or two days ago. And there's a video of a guy like in a Hampton Inn, and I'm like, I've probably been in that Hampton Inn, <laughs> like the whole thing blown out. So, but I think you can manage. Uh, lightning's really the scary thing because you can't predict it. So, uh, and I don't. There's some people that take a lot of risk and get really, really close to these big storms, and there have been people killed doing that. Um, to me, it's not that interesting being up that close because what I want to do is see the whole. As a photographer, especially, I want to see the whole storm. Like that's that's the amazing thing. Um, and actually, it's funny, this picture, though, is I was in Texas, and I was by myself on that road. There was a, like 100 chasers over on the other side, and the thing started coming in towards me, and you always maintain an escape route. Um, you know, like, okay, and I, you're in a, that's the other thing is kind of interesting, like, you're in a weird place you've never been, and you'll never be again. Actually, I've been on the same road, like, several times since then. Um, and then on my escape route, another circulation started forming. I could see it on radar. And that was scary because then you're like, because I don't know, this thing's coming at me. My escape route may be blocked. And then fortunately it dissipated. But like, but it's a, it's really intense, like managing all that stuff, navigating, trying to get a good photo. You know, that's uh, so when I get out there. I mean, I think the big thing to me about it is like when I'm out there, I'm not thinking about anything else. Like I'm just thinking about that one thing. That's awesome. Yeah. And then you drive, awesome. you drive, it's like being a truck driver. You're like. I'm going to be because the other thing when you wake up in the morning, you don't know where you're going to be at night. So the you don't you can't book a hotel until like four or five, six o'clock at the earliest. And um, you're driving like 500 miles a day a lot of times. So if you're lucky, like things will stay in one area, but usually they're moving. So got it outside of it. You know, you mentioned uh, in there something about, uh, you know, how mobile technology ch uh, or availability changed the game. Um, we're getting a little late on time but can you maybe just quickly mention tell us how do you think 5g when it's like in a full rollout is going to change show networking um it's interesting i think there's and i actually have a 5g phone now uh and i've noticed absolutely no difference so the, um uh because i had pretty good you know I, I have like the unlimited plan for chasing and stuff um it's interesting. I think we're going to have to see how it goes. I think there's an immense amount of hype about 5G, which I don't know. There's a lot of money people in there. And once they start like uh, talking about things that are possible, they often don't know what they're talking about. <laughs> or they're talking about things that, um, you know, might be interesting in theory, but won't really, you know, it's sort of like, oh, you got to have an 8K TV now or whatever, you know, like, uh, my old 1080p TV here is fine. Like I'm not upgrading it. So I think, I don't know. I think we'll see what happens. But again, to me, if, if, if I'm running it on fiber or copper, like it doesn't affect me anyway. Um, I think the, you know, we have in like local Wi-Fi speeds, we have some pretty immense speeds already that we're not really maximizing. Um, so we'll see, we'll see how it goes. But I, I think there's a lot of like, Ooh, 5g, 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 which is great for, I'm, I'm hoping I mean, most likely when I'm in Kansas, I won't have it. So that's where I would want it. Those are the people that really need it. Cause it's some of the, the wireless out there is terrible, but like here in Brooklyn, I see on my phone, like, Oh, the 5g thing is turned on. I don't notice any difference. So we'll see. Gotcha. So I, I want to ask you one last question before we wrap things up. You gave us an evolution of how the industry kind of uh, evolved it in, in itself. Where do you foresee things going in the future? Um, that's a good question. I think uh, so when I was researching this timeline and I wrote there's two articles I wrote that are on my website about it. One is for more from sort of the educational aspect and the other is more from sort of pure technology um and i think i think what we just see is more of everything right we see more integration um and i had an in interesting conversation with the guy uh i'm gonna draw a blank on his name but he's the like chief creative officer for uh tate which make all these unbelievable structures and integrated you know really amazing like any big tour you've seen that has incredible scenery on it they built it and they have, they're part of the Rock Littest thing out in Pennsylvania and all that kind of stuff. And he said, you know, they had spent a lot of time in recent years on making a really amazing uh, show deck that was all magnetic, right? You don't need any tools. Wow. So that, and that's a thing, you can get it now on tour. So that's, but that if functionally, 
that's no different than we had in 1965, right? 1965, we had a stage, but it would take a hundred people at two days to build it. Yes. Now it's like this thing you roll it in the arena. You, you, nobody needs a screwdriver. Click, click, click. Boom is together. So that yeah, I'm sorry, I, I stepped on you. What was that? No, I said just clicks and locks. Yeah. <laughs> So that's, I think that's sort of what we're seeing more of everything is like optimizing, integrating, making it faster and cheaper and easier to do, which I think, again, means more of everything. And then the other thing that they're working on, and this was like two years ago, but I think it's the, the trend still happening, is that now they had, you know, pretty, I don't want to say off the shelf, but they had, you know, pretty uh, straightforward solutions to like integrate between systems. Right. You're still going to have a lighting console because that's optimized for the lighting people and the way they work. You're still going to have an, a scenic automation console mm -hmm. that's optimized for them. That has safety consideration. Still going to have a sound console, but and you have a video server, whatever you're doing. But they now had a lot of flexible code in their systems to allow you. They're not going to let you, you know, the video server like move the platform all over the place, but they are going to export out the position of the platform so you could map your video projection on it or something. And again, that was pos been possible for a long time, but now it's just easier and faster. Of course, you connect it with Ethernet and sort of work it out. So I, I think where I see things, and again, when I talk about like mature technologies in the timeline, and it, certainly innovation is still happening, right? But I think it's moving more into integration uh, software. And the, the, the nice thing about that is that it's, it's faster and cheaper and easier to do, right? Because now I see shows, you know, here in New York that, have just off of one laptop they have the sophistication that would have been in a theme park in the 80s right so i think and now our storytellers are really just sort of wrangling with this and trying to figure it out um you know what's possible and i think that because we can do all kinds of stuff but what we really need is like creative usages of the of the technology and that takes some sort of visionary people with it. and then the other thing i think that's happening now the big buzzword is this immersive stuff and uh, I find it fascinating that like uh, most of the, the immersive, well-known immersive things I've seen, which are amazing, like the Meow Wolf out in Santa Fe, which is incredible. Um, there was the, oh, I'm forgetting the museum in, San, in St. Louis, uh, City Museum. Uh, this thing I just went to uh, a couple years ago is Theater Bazaar to Detroit. Unbelievable. Almost, well, they have some standard show technology in it, but there's no, it's not like theme park grade stuff that you're seeing. In there. So, so, but then the other thing, and I wrote this up a little bit on my blog, but I saw, luckily, right before the shutdown, I saw the um, rise of the resistance at, in Orlando. Uh, and it is unbelievable. That is, I think, is the most sophisticated dark ride ever made. If, if I know you're in Orlando, I would go over there and ride that thing six times in a row if I could, while there's no crowd. <laughs> Cause I went in there, like we went in, I went in with my buddy that worked on it and he hadn't even been able to ride it. And we had to get in the lottery at like six o'clock in the morning before the sun's up. And you hear these people like screaming all around the waiting area when they got their number on their phone. And, but it was worth it. Like it was, nice. it was really incredible. And there's whole ride through videos online you can see. But then again, if you look at that, that's a great example of, uh, and I'm sure my friends at Disney will probably correct me, but there's not a lot of new technology in that, right? What's what's there? What what they did though is integrate a lot of really amazing stuff very well. Like you go through that whole attraction, which is a, if people don't know, it's in the the new newer Star Wars uh, land. Um, and if you're a Star Wars fan, there's you'll get way more out of it than the average like me than I did. Um, but you don't see a stage light in there. You don't see a speaker. You don't see a video projector. All of those things are there. But they're so well integrated into the world that you can't even tell. You and don't then, even notice. Yeah. And then the integration is like a trackless vehicle that rides around. And the integration of all that, again, integration timing, the, the again, enabled by networks, right, is so seamless that it's really, really incredible. But I don't think there wasn't anything in the, the attraction that I saw that um, wasn't like, oh, that's I've never seen that before. Like, yeah. Was, the big thing for me, which may never be solved, is the classic, um, you know, the uh, Princess Leia projection, right? Volumetric projection in 3D space. Um, I don't, that may not be solvable by physics. I don't know. We'll see. Uh, but like somebody does something like that, that's like a game changer. But all the yeah. other stuff that I'm seeing, like drones are a good example. And if you saw like the Biden inauguration, not, not the inauguration, but the Biden announcement that they did, 
had really amazing drone work in it. And I saw a bunch of drones down at Disney a few years ago, which were cool, but now that's sort of mature, but even that is not, it looks cool and it's an amazing, I'm not knocking, I think it's an amazing technology, but it's nothing really like from a technological aspect, it's just more stuff that existed, right? Yeah. We had that network, it's an LED, like none of those things had to be invented to make that happen. What it was though, what it is, is a really cool integration of those things to make something that we haven't seen before, but it's not like we're inventing fireworks or- Absolutely. You know, you know, things and like sometimes that. it's as basic as taking those little few things that you do know and, and how to make them integrate and, and work together. Yeah. Man, John, you've dropped so much knowledge on us tonight and I, the, the community, I'm sure that, that they have so much more to ask and, and want to get involved. But first and foremost, I do want to tell you thank you for everything that you did share with us tonight. Um, before we let you go, uh, I'm going to give you your, your quick 30 seconds to give your shameless plugs. Um, let the let the community know where we can find uh, this information. You got two golden books out there. If guys don't want to take advantage of the hard copy, I know that you have the ebook as well. Um, let's drop some link in, in in the comments so that the community can feed off of. And it, I'm sure, and also information as to how they can get in contact with you and get in touch with you after the fact. Sure. Yeah. The um, uh, everything I have linked from my website, which is controlgeek.net. And okay. I have on there like how to get the book and all that stuff, the timeline. It's you have to dig a little bit to find it, but everything's linked back in there. And then um, one thing I really encourage people to do, uh, as long as things keep progressing along, we're hoping to do this Graves and in again uh, this fall. It is 2021 now, right? Um, yes. <laughs> the, uh, all indications so far is we'll be able to do it. We won't know really till later in the summer, but. Um, people i really encourage people to come see that we charge like 10 bucks or something all the money goes back into it but the reason i encourage people to see it um and this is driving me crazy because i have a new webcam and it's staying out of focus so it's like driving me nuts. <laughs> but, uh, um the uh, uh anyway I encourage people to see it because all the technology is viewable after you exit the attraction and there's oh thanks somebody posted the website in there um the so you can come back and actually see there's not you can see a bunch of lights blinking but you can see the network you can see our sort of surveillance systems the integration the show control is all there and there's a big sort of trick at the end i don't want to we don't really talk about too much publicly that you want to hang around for but i encourage you it's gravesandin.org to come see that we hope to be back this october but if you're anywhere in new york come see it and again come hang out afterwards i'm usually there uh, or, or I can I can be there if I know people are coming, but that's a great way to sort of see all this stuff in action in a way that's all open. So. Awesome, awesome! Thank you again, John. Ed, you had anything else final you wanted to say before we let John go? Uh, no, John. Th again, thanks very much. Great talk. Um, it's it's wonderful to talk networking with someone uh, at such a, a high level of understanding. Uh, so thank you for uh, entertaining my silly questions. Um, <laughs> You know, we'll have to have you back at some time or or have you on AV Tech Talks because uh, I was told uh, that you have a cat that you like to talk oh, about in class, I guess, uh, oh. and uh, something about a haunted hotel. So we're yeah. going to have to have you back to, to find out more about those stories. And, uh, and and again, just thank you very much for everything. Oh, uh, yeah, it was my my honor, my pleasure. And it's yeah, Popsicle Kitty is sitting on her tower over there. Usually, <laughs> I don't know why. I guess she's tired, but usually she joins every online meeting I'm in, whether I like it or not. So, <laughs> thank you again, John. Oh, thanks very much. It was great. All right. So, Austin, man. So yeah, much, man, like you it, said, it, so much knowledge. So much, so much. And, and he, what I like about it is he got into it, into the nitty gritty, quick, urgent, and we got so much, so much to offer so quickly. But it's necessary information, especially with the way that the industry has been transitioning. I can't even say transitioning currently. It's been happening. Um, the fact that people are, are operating remotely, we talked about that on, on AV Tech Talks quite, quite a few times, but integration, show networking, it, it's all absolutely mandatory and necessary skills that I feel need to come aboard, especially with the way that things are, are turning. Um, it, it was an absolute pleasure to have him here tonight. Absolutely. Yeah, no, and, and you know, it's so, so poignant in these times, especially as we start coming back to, to work. You know, anybody who, uh, you know, hasn't been working 
start learning networking because that's where it's going to be. There's been so many leaps and bounds made over the last, you know, year or so uh, that we've kind of been out of work and uh and it's just going to be like gangbusters coming back we're all going to have to yes. you know so so learn now so you're not playing catch up later uh and but and start by picking up john's book um the uh introduction to show networking is the new book the thinner one um but the other one was uh show networks and control systems if uh if you want to get into you know even more depth uh, and if you don't like flipping physical pages, feel free to check out the website, even get the ebook. You can read that on your iPad, on your phone, whatever is comfortable for you. But the wealth of knowledge that's in there, it's all valuable and necessary information for us to continue progressing, growing, and moving forward. But yep. AV Educate, it has been an absolute pleasure to be with you guys again tonight and, and share this time and this information with you. And I look forward to seeing you guys next week, Wednesday, same time, same place. And I, I hopefully look forward to having Omar back next week where I can sit on Facebook and, and, and just enjoy watching. Uh, but it was a pleasure, uh, pleasure oh, co-hosting wait. with you tonight, Austin. And, oh. uh, you know, happy to come back, but uh, looking forward to getting Omar back in. And uh, maybe we'll see some of you guys on, uh, on Monday on the AV Tech Talks. Yes, sir. You all guys right. all enjoy the rest of it. Take care. Have, Have a good, good night. night. Bye-bye.